αντίστοιχε γλώσσε. Όταν λέω ενδιαφέρουσα δράση, εννοώ ότι το θέμα που επιλέγει και αφορά στι ιστορίε που εμπνέουν όλου εμά μέσα από τι μνήμε για την κοινοκτονία των Αρμενίων. Γι' αυτό εξάλλου το Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου έχει προσκαλέσει για το σκοπό αυτό ειδικά έναν καταξιωμένο άνθρωπο που έχει να μα πει πολλά, τον Δ. Πολ Χάιτοστιάν, πρόεδρο του Πανεπιστημίου Χάικαζιάν του Λιβάνου. Η 24η Απριλίου, κυρίε και κύριοι, καθιερώθηκε παγκόσμια ω ημέρα μνήμη τη γενοκτονία των Αρμενίων από του Νεότουρκου. Πρόκειται για ένα από τα μεγαλύτερα εγκλήματα κατά τη ανθρωπότητα στη νεότερη ιστορία του κόσμου, που εκτεταμένα ξεκίνησε να εφαρμόζεται από το κίνημα των Νεότουρκων. 1,5 εκατομμύριο άνθρωποι, αθώοι και άμαχοι, σφαγιάστηκαν ανεριθρίαστρα, ενώ εκατοντάδε χιλιάδε κακοποιήθηκαν βάναυσα, εκτοπίστηκαν βίαια ή υποδουλώθηκαν στο πλαίσιο ενός οργανωμένου και προμελετημένου σχεδίου εξόντωσης του αρμενικού έθνους. Καλώ το βήμα των Πρίτανη του Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου καθηγητή Τάσο Χριστοφίδη για να χαιρετήσει τη σημερινή μας εκδήλωση που είναι δικαιωματικά αφιερωμένη στους Αρμενίους. Κύριε Πρίτανη. Well, I will be speaking in English, so in case uh, you need to have a translation, please go ahead and get some headphones. Uh, dear Mr. Bakhtesian, representative of the Armenian community to the parliament, dear colleagues, dear vice director of academic affairs, dear colleagues, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to host today the lecture of my friend, Professor Paul Haidostian, President of the Haigazian University. Uh, we met uh, last time in uh, Erevan in 2019 for the 100th celebration of the University of uh, Erevan. And uh, since then, we've been in touch. And in fact, we have signed an agreement between the two universities, an agreement of cooperation between the University of Cyprus and the University of the Haigazian University of uh, Beirut. Uh, today we'll, we'll discuss about stories that inspire, stories that have messages to send and memories to unveil concerning the Armenian genocide. Why is it important to listen to human stories? Why is it necessary to unpack memories? Well, it is because individual stories and experiences are part of a country's history. It is because human stories build the cultural identities, the hopes, the fears of a nation, and its aspiration for the future. Through, through storytelling and through the critical analysis of stories background, a nation and its people evolve. The 24th of April is established as the Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day. For a nation to move forward, Truth must be told, faced, and accepted. More than ever, now, the world realizes that politics, nationalism, and geopolitics have actual impact on people's lives. Pain, death, violence, violation of one's space and rights, forced migration are just a few examples of the results of systematic destruction efforts and war. We, as Cypriots, have witnessed these painful situations because of the Turkish invasion in 1974, and we are witnessing right now these tragic images today in the heart of Europe. In 1915, the persecution of Armenians by the Turks was initiated aiming at the method methodical extinction of Armenians from the Ottoman Empire. Today, Dr. Haidostian will present stories from uh, the tragic period of the Armenian Genocide, showcasing a nation's resilience and determination to survive and thrive. We remember, we open bridges for collaboration through acceptance and recognition of the mistakes and crimes of the past as an honest relationship is what eventually allows people and nations to overcome their differences. I am looking forward to today's uh, intriguing lecture 
And I thank once again President Haidostian, my friend Paul Haidostian, for its, his presence uh, here along with uh, his wife, Maral, here at the University of Cyprus. I hope that this is only the beginning of uh, a number of activities, joint activities, uh, between the University of Cyprus and uh, Haigazian University, uh, given that we have signed the agreement of cooperation. Uh, and I think that we have a lot to talk about, both for the, for the Armenian genocide, for both for the province of Cyprus and problems of contemporary history and politics. Thank you so much. Once more, welcome to Cyprus. Ευχαριστούμε θερμά κύριε Πρίτανη. Αξίζει να αναφερθεί ότι κατά την Εθνική Μέρα Μνήμης της Γενοκτονίας του Αρμενικού Έθνους στην Κυπριακή Βουλή των Αντιπροσώπων τρίθηκε μονόλεπτη σιγή στη Μνήμη των Θυμάτων της Αρμενικής Γενοκτονίας. Τα μέλη της Βουλής καταδίκασαν για πολλοστή φορά το αποτρόπαιο αυτό γεγονός και ταυτόχρονα δήλωσαν τη συμπαράστασή τους στον φίλο Αρμενικό λαό. Παράλληλα, απευθύνθηκε έκκληση προς τη διεθνή κοινότητα για καθολική αναγνώριση της γενοκτονίας των Αρμενίων από τις χώρες και κράτη του πλανήτη μας. Σημειώνω ότι η Κύπρος αποτέλεσε την πρώτη χώρα στην Ευρώπη που αναγνώρισε τη γενοκτονία, καθιερώνοντάς την με ομόφωνο ψήφισμα της Βουλής των Αντιπροσώπων από το 1990. Έφτασε όμως η στιγμή να ακούσουμε τον επίσημο καλεσμένο μας, τον δόκτωρα Πολ Χαϊτοστιάν, και τα όσα σημαντικά έχει να μας μεταφέρει μέσα από την ομιλία του με τίτλο «Ιστορίες που εμπνέουν αποσυσκευάζοντα τη μνήμη της γενοκτονίας των Αρμενιών». Dr. Haitostian, I welcome you once again. We are ready to listen from you as your speech topic suggests about the stories that inspire unbaking Armenian genocide memory. The floor is yours. I greet you and I thank you, uh, first, uh, Rector Christofides, uh, Vice Rector, Mr. Mahdesian, Mrs. Mahdesian, and dear friends who are here and are watching online. It is an, my honor to be here uh, with you uh, today at this university. We have indeed so much, not only in common, but we have so much homework for the future for human society, for Middle Eastern societies, um, for the Armenians uh, all around the world, including Armenia and Artsakh, but also for, uh, for Cyprus and, and towards the end of my lecture, also for the, for the whole Greek uh, population in other countries and other places as well. Now coming to Lebanon, I should mention to my friends, uh, to the, all of you here, I should mention that we all know that the flight from Beirut to Cyprus is quick, it's short, uh, but I think I should add that once in a while we remember how close our countries are. On August 4th, uh, 2020, at the explosion uh, in Beirut, after the explosion, I spoke with uh, my friend, the rector, uh, Tassos, the rector, and uh, he also mentioned to me that his office in this building shook. Uh, if you want to have an additional sign of how close we are and how close our destinies would be, uh, that's yet another sign. There are also lots of other points in common. Now, it is my custom in the past years to choose for a topic of a presentation abroad something that speaks first to my heart, because if it doesn't speak to my heart, then chances are it will not also speak to others' hearts. So that I chose something quite close to my heart. When one day I shared with a visitor 
my plan to lecture on the genocide, he asked me what benefit there was to visit the past. Can you explain to me, he said, what do you benefit if you visit the past? Of course, I did not give an answer in a similar way. Often in the Middle East region, people are blamed for putting too much focus on the past. It's pain, it's suffering, victimization, for putting too much emphasis on the past. But also, in finding the highest pride of a nation in the wealth of past civilizations and kingdoms and not on its current state. Both are problematic. Both past-oriented opposites are presented as problematic in a pragmatic world today. So early in this lecture, I will attempt to develop an answer to, what I, to this problem of the past. I believe that humans are humans because they are able to inspire and to be inspired by others. I believe humans are humans because we are able to inspire and to be inspired by others. By inspiration, I mean being positively renewed and enriched within, usually due to an external factor, something from the outside. It could mean finding new energy to live better today and with higher causes and with higher ideals. It means being enriched with feelings and ideas that lead us deeper in our appreciation for life today. True. Inspiration is sometimes the aesthetic reaction to forms of music or fine arts, but it is common with regard also to prayer and spiritual expressions. Inspiration may also come from a saying, from a word someone spoke to us that enlightens the heart, the mind. It could be from an observed gesture of someone else that edifies our heart. However, saying, having said all this, in my conviction, certain types of stories are the key for inspiration. Some stories are the key for inspiration. By being inspired by stories, we build up nations. Nations exist because they have stories that inspire. We raise the new generation with stories that have the ability to inspire. We take initiatives. We stay attached to other people. We keep the faith in God. We keep affinity to land and nature. We even draft laws in the government. We dream for the future because we are inspired somewhere. Now to an opening story unrelated to the genocide, but I'll use it to enter. Possibly in the year 2016, that is five years after the start of the war in Syria, I was on a flight from Beirut to Yerevan, Armenia. I was on the front row of the economy section at the window. The plane was full. I usually know lots of people on such flights. On that day, I didn't know these people. They were mostly Armenians from Aleppo, Syria, who were using Beirut airport. Soon, within a few minutes, a person next to me started a conversation with his neighbor on the other side. Are you not the mechanic on such a street in Aleppo, he asked. Oh, yes, I am, he said. They looked at each other. Oh, and you are the goldsmith. You have a workshop near me. Oh, yes, he said. So, when did you leave Aleppo? Oh, we left early in 2012. We went to Beirut, and we stayed in Beirut first, he said. I see. 
we left two years later under sniper fire and shelling, but then we directly came to Armenia. It's much of a longer story, this conversation, the flight. Eventually, five people, I remember, on two rows, participated in this group discussion, telling and sharing, comparing and mourning, or feeling lucky for their situation. And then they moved to family updates. A divorce here, a divorce there, an illness here, children growing up here and there, and so forth. Now, unlike my character, for those of you who know me, I did not interfere in this discussion. I usually do, but I didn't interfere. As honestly in my mind, I was asking another question. I was asking whether this was also not how exit and migration stories are told, or untold and forgotten, and they become part of the wider story of martyrdom, survival, Revival throughout humanity, wherever you may be. This story of migration and exile and departing and leaving home and so on, it could have been Adana, it could have been Garapa, Artsakh, it could have been Mosul or Famagusta. How many stories of families were not told to the others or told to a few who passed away and they missed the chance for inspiration out of that story. And the story died with them and so did the chance for inspiration. Now for a historian of war and migration, the collections of these stories will help create categories and make comparisons and important scientific generalizations about human behavior but for the victims themselves, for the victims and their descendants. These stories form their identity. As stories of resilience and details of these stories are the ones that shape families and nations. These stories are the ones that shape. So it's not simply genetics in a family. It's not simply living under one roof that shapes what it shapes. A story is not its summary or its generalization. A story is its details, its nuance, its mood, its inner connections, interconnections. Along with many others, in my generation and the one before, we have often asked about details that may have been lost for good and will not be recovered regarding the Armenian history, for example, and other histories and the countless stories of every victimized nation. But 100 years later, that is after the genocide in 2015 and still now, would it make a difference? What difference will it specifically make? The answer depends on how aware one is of the importance of shared and rehearsed memory. As human beings, humans maintain, maintain identity only as long as they have an enriched memory. Humans only maintain identity as long as they have enriched memory and they make constructive and viable sense out of that memory. So let me move on to another story. We always knew, we in, in our family, the Haidostian family, let's say, that our immediate family had escaped a town called Marash, Silesia, almost 100 years ago, close to 100 years ago. And then they moved from Marash to Aleppo, uh, which was quite some time after a battle, uh, an attack, the Battle of Marash uh, in 1920, early in 1920. Now, I was often curious as to how they had escaped, how they had moved from Marash to Aleppo, like in any war. After so many years, 
you want to have some details. How did they move to Maharashtra Aleppo, a distance that's more than 200 kilometers? In those days, 200 kilometers is quite a bit. Now, there were many routes, by the way, from different Cilician towns to Syria and to Lebanon, but especially to Aleppo. There were many routes under unsafe conditions. Some were very dramatic, some were very tragic. Uh, we have ample stories of details of how each family moved. Some families have recorded it, others haven't. Our family had recorded many things, but they had not recorded how they moved from that town, original town of Marash, to later where they arrived in Aleppo. Since no one gave us details, and I, I don't remember this part of any story in the family, and because when they arrived in Aleppo, they had a mission, and the mission was to start life again, to survive, to raise their and other people's generation. They had details um, to, to educate, to, you know, to raise children and so on. They weren't as interested in transmitting details of the tragedy, as you know, as they were interested in the details of the new life they were, being, they were trying to found. Now back to the story. Because I didn't know anything, I had assumed that as my grandfather had been a prominent educator in a German institution, in a German uh, orphanage belonged to the Hilfsbund mission. It was called, uh, the orphanage was called Bet Shalom, a uh, German orphanage. I assumed that my grandfather, his wife, I mean my grandmother and their children had escaped in a very comfortable way. Because you know, nowadays we know, I mean, he should have gone from the town of Marash to Aleppo uh, first class because he was a well-known person. This is an assumption, huh? The first class of their days. Then it was only eight years ago, eight years ago, huh? after all these years that I was checking in a book written in the USA by the daughter of the survivor of the genocide, where there was a line in the book, it was a line or two lines and so on, where it said that we were in a caravan from their town and we were being looted and attacked by the bandits, by Kurdish forces, by thieves and whoever. Uh, so we had nothing left and so on and caravans right and left. And she says, oh how happy she was somewhere on the way when they stopped and they met others, other people in caravans. They met the Haidostian family and she said, oh, I was so happy that with Mr. Haidostian, the grandfather, was his son, who was my kindergarten student. <clears throat> so this was my father's kindergarten teacher in the middle of this strange place. How happy we were, we met them. So somehow my question was answered. This is a photo, by the way, of the uh, orphanage leadership. Uh, on the far side, seated uh, are my grandfather uh, and grandmother on, on the far side, seated, Hovannes and Yester, uh, and, and the other leadership. Now, this is the book that I'm telling you about in which I read it, uh, and, and you read many such stories of other people in that book. And as I was preparing for this lecture, I also tried to read pages from another book. This is in English, another book in Armenian, which has dozens of stories similar to the deportation, how each one moved, how each one didn't move, and so on. So they were in one of those caravans. Uh, these were, the caravans, of course, um, were not always organized, and uh, usually uh, uh, they were driven, uh, driven by some animal, whatever the animal would be, um, 
and some families with whatever stuff they had, uh, they would carry with them and so on. Uh, but in the, among the stories, I also read that people left other people behind when they were organizing these caravans. So suddenly news would come that an air caravan is organized, we're moving from this town or the other town, and then they would suddenly remember, boy, we forgot that school, that church where hundreds of people were. So they were leaving them behind. But so, I mean, again, I'll come back to this. What's the big deal? My grandparents and father, how they moved in this one and that one. Anyway, I'm coming back to this story to be a bit critical. Is it important 100 years later to have the answer to such details? I would say there is at least one reason for satisfaction. At least one reason, I can list others. Whatever the story and whatever the details, we all need to own our story. To own our story. Because if you don't own it, you cannot transmit it. And this is also true about causes, by the way, all justice causes. Causes die when there is no one demanding. True? I mean, if you say it's okay, this will pass. This is okay. So we have to own it so that we may transmit it. It is my story. This story I told you is my story. And it is a story I have transmitted to our daughters. And then that's how they will find whatever else they will find. And I am the story eventually. It's not only an object in me. I am this story. Of course, uh, dear friends, whether you're Armenian, non-Armenian, and so on, um, these lands, I mean, including Cyprus, uh, I was very little. I remember uh, 1974. I do remember because my father was always listening to the BBC and uh, I do remember the story and every time I've come to Cyprus in the 80s and the 90s and so on, every time I ride a taxi, I would check where this person is from, from which side. And then I would ask them, oh, so what happened? So what happened to your house? What happened to your family, uh, etc." That's not a detail, friends. That is who I am. That is who you are. So I, we cannot be simply utilitarian in our story. We cannot simply say, so what's the good use? When it's your story, it's your story. You don't need to justify why you have your story. I, I think for life to continue, we need the pathos as well. We are educators, your professors, your teachers. I am an academician myself. But there is more. The feeling is in the context and the details. Such is identity come together. If I cannot make sense of my father's and mother's and their parents' stories, then with what ingredient will I create my story? Will I shape my story, which will be different than my parents' story? But they are the ingredients of mine. Then how will I shape, how will I, how I develop, with what depth, with what dimensions? So back to my grandfather's part, the way I would make sense of what I know about him after they settled in Aleppo, so they moved to Aleppo, is how they raised their family. That was the next detail I was interested in, I'm still interested in. So what did they say to their children? How did they raise their children? to what standards, based on what causes, what value systems, and so on. And how they resumed their mission to take care of themselves and their families and other families and the rest of the details that cannot be separated from transmitting human values and attitudes and why not, Christian values. All this that I'm talking about, for me, helps us, helps me, and helps you furnish our own imagination. We need to equip and furnish our imagination. Part of the problem of the world, including the current world, is a problem of imagination. 
for imagination to be wide and deep, you need all the details of not only sciences, but also the personal and the collective and the national and the spiritual and so on. So identity is formed when imagination is enriched. Our imagination is also formed out of stories. Then these stories stay with us somehow and they bring meaning to the present and in the hope that they will guide something for the future. Now, a, wor a word of caution I should give here. This should not mean that family culture should be a prison. It's not a box. Family history is not a box. Family culture is not a prison. But it is a home where one feels one is their own. There's ownership, sense of ownership. And what a loss it is for any new family or generation whose imagination is only based on what is today and is not enriched with stories, personally owned stories that would give long-term meaning. It would be like a colorless sky. It would be like a frozen fire. In this regard, here are some, I'll give just a couple of illustrations from our family so that you know what, with what method I'm, I'm thinking today. I'll give illustrations. Now that all my grandparents, four grandparents, were from the same German orphanage, by the way, the orphanage. So all four of them were there. One of them was an orphan, but all of them are from not only the same town, but from that same German orphanage. So what's the meaning of, of that one, that they were from a German orphanage? I'll tell you when I understood it. When I graduated from Haigazian University in 1984, I went uh, to Germany, uh, invitation of my aunt. The minute I went into a society where everyone speaks German, I immediately went back 70 years. Immediately, I didn't need an effort. I suddenly imagined my grandparents hearing German all the time back in another country. That's not an automatic issue. How do I cash this, this check? I don't care. It's my story, as I'm telling you. So that's one way of illustrating how it helps me. Another one, for those of you who are interested in embroidery, uh, Armenian embroidery, Marash embroidery, and so on, we always knew that uh, my grandmother and aunts and so on did embroidery. And embroidery was, for them, like one of the highest values in life. Um, how did that impact my life? The minute I see embroidery of any culture, wherever I am in the world, uh, my wife will testify. If I don't get anything, or I don't buy anything, I will buy a piece of embroidery. That's a, that's a value system that was transmitted. Even though if that embroidery is not mine, I mean, it could be Bulgarian, uh, it could be Brazilian or something else. I'll uh, give another one. That my grandfather, Hovannes, whose picture is so. In the Marash battle, 1920, um, the town had to organize a committee to go and negotiate with the Turkish attackers. Uh, so the committee was to go and uh, meet with a Turkish ruler. Uh, at that point, he was ruler of the Marash area. His name was uh, Ali, Ali Kilaj, so he was to be part of the negotiating group. Um, they had, uh, at that point, uh, well, I think they had their eight children already, little kids. People came to my grandmother, and they told her, you sh your husband shouldn't go. You have eight kids. Your husband may not come back. So we, we grew up with this story, by the way. This story, we have been told a lot. So let people who are not married with no children, let them go because chances are they'll not come back. Okay, so as children, we always heard from my aunt a line. You know what your grandmother told these people who said, let your husband not go? Uh, your grandmother said to these people, when the voice of the nation speaks, all other voices should be silent. Okay, so there's this line. Now, as children, I didn't understand what this meant. 
What does this mean? Uh, that there are some voices that have to be heard. There are other voices that should not be heard. Now, believe it or not, dear friends, these are some examples of what I presented to you 10 minutes ago, of, of how identity is transmitted. These types of memories, stories, statements, words, images, they shape the new generation's way. And I personally valued these concepts of personal identity, spirituality, nationhood, because of this. Now, the passage of time is not sufficient for memory to be unpacked, because some of this memory is somewhere else. I don't own it. It's hidden somewhere. The passage of time is not sufficient for the unpacking of memory. It's not like some things will be known tomorrow. We didn't know them now. Generations later, the story is not complete. And the Armenian story is not complete. It should continually unpack itself. The files should be opening all the time. And the data has to be retrieved. Of course, new sciences are helping us. Um, new sciences are helping unpack history, unpack crimes of the past. I do remember uh, during my days in the USA, I used to follow some crimes, criminal stories, and then when the DNA uh, sciences developed, suddenly they're saying, oh, no, this wasn't the killer. The other one was the killer. There are sciences that are coming to help us unpack the past. And this is, of course, welcome. Uh, now, in the year 2015, as I said, the world commemorated the 100th or the anniversary or centenary of the genocide. And one of the outcomes was our renewed interest in history and in the story. There was a renewed issue. Along, alongside the more directly political efforts of such matters as the recognition of the genocide, such as in the parliament here and in, in many other countries and so on, but there was also a personal unpacking of many family histories. Not only were conferences organized, but equally importantly, people shared on social media, reintroducing writings, photos, memoirs, and books. As genocide is a generic term, Armenian genocide is also a generic one, once more we realized that each one of the one and a half million victims is a person is a name. That's part of the unpacking. In, in the family case, for example, that I said, in our church printed records in a number of books, I had always read the name of Kaspar, Reverend Kaspar Haidostian, as someone who died in the genocide. I've, I've read this. You know, we have a list of 100 Protestant pastors who were killed and so on. His name is there. Okay, I've seen this. I don't know any other detail. His, his uh, cousin of my grandfather, and so on. Only in 2015, and by accident, I read a paragraph in a book about Marash. I read a paragraph about this Reverend Kaspar Aydostian, where it stated that in 1915, he and his family moved to Hama, Syria, in 1918, he was told, everything is OK. There is a truce. You can come back to town. So he goes back in three years' town, time. And he becomes pastor of the third Armenian evangelical church, which is where our family went. So the story said, in 1920, when the Marash attack was happening, this Kaspar and his family, wife and kids, were killed by the sword in their house and their heads were thrown outside the door of the church uh, parsonage, the pastor's house, the church house. This story I had never heard. And then suddenly uh, a new reality hit me. So again, completing stories of families is a solidifying factor in identity. It is not to get a scientific degree. It is not for popularity. It's not 
for marketing. It is for me. Maybe he gave us examples. Maybe one of the examples that I took, for example, from this man, was that during the war, he moved from one place to the other. He faced cruelty and this one, that one, and so on. Maybe one lesson is about cruelty past and cruelty continued. Suddenly I realized that the way I have to understand today's cruelty in the world, in the Middle East, in Europe, elsewhere, is a continuation of the human nature that was functioning there with its failures. Maybe it gave us, from within family history, an example of what it means to be sacrificing for the community and for the nation. Now, in this way, the centenary of the genocide was an occasion to dig deeper. 100 years later and on, and the stories kept unpacking, and they will keep unpacking, family by family, story by story. But only if there is one who has still the stamina to unpack. Only if we have the stamina to unpack. Not when we say the past is a past. Well, there's a future, but the past is me. The past is mine. Only when there is someone who's interested in owning the story. While more than a century has passed, the stories and specifics of the genocide are still being unpacked, not only by historians and archivists, but also by descendants of the survivors. One such piece of the puzzle also happened two years ago at our university. And for those of you who may not know me, it may not be a common knowledge. Our university is named after Armenag Haigazian, and Armenag Haigazian is one of the victims of the Armenian genocide. Because he was a popular person, well-known, educated leader, um, lots of things were written about him. But we realize at the university, at the 100th commemoration of his death, which was July 7th, um, just of last year, we realized that there were too many contradictions in the story. Lots of people told about him, but they said contradicting things. During the 100th commemoration of the death of Armen Akhaigazian, we therefore restructured the story. We put new pieces of the puzzle that we researched. We are regularly inspired, are regularly inspired by Haigazian's story. He was a theologian, he was a musician, he was a linguist. And after years of education in the USA and having received his degree uh, from the University of Yale, he returned to his people to lead an institution in Konya. Konya, where also a huge number of uh, Greek population live. He graduated from high school in 1885. 1892, theological degree, mathematics degree from the St. Paul Institute in Tarsus. 1898, Yale University, doctoral degree on Hebrew and the Old Testament. Music education at the University of Toronto for one year. And then he came to be the president of the Apostolic Institute of Konya 1899, till the day he fell victim. The Apostolic Institute was mostly serving Armenians and some Greeks. Um, board of directors were Americans, as you see in the faculty and the instructors. He is the president. And then there's Reverend Ashjan, there's Stepanian, etc., etc. And um, so he was the leader. This is his wife. In 1915, the family was exiled from Konya, and um, later he was saved. In 1921, May 22, he was arrested on a Sunday where he was seated on the stage with lots of children, his students, on a Sunday school playing music. And Haigazian has a video of a witness who was one of the kids. This lady. In, from the 1990s, she tells the story of, of how they came and she describes the footsteps of the Turkish soldiers who were coming in. 
and they're taking their president and their kids doing Sunday school on a Sunday. He was sent to Harput on exile, hands tied. We have witnesses who have written about him, how he was walking, this famous professor, president, was walking with his hands tied on the streets. Um, he arrived in Harput physically almost collapsed and ill. They didn't allow him. They took him to physical isolation. They didn't allow him to go to the hospital for a long time till it deteriorated. Eventually, belatedly, he was taken to the Mezire Hospital. These are the doctors. And then he dies singing a Christian hymn in his bed, and he was buried at this church. This is near Harput. The New York Times said, Professor Aigazian dies of typhus at, at Harput. President of American College, Konya, was being deported into the interior. Years later, here's the unpacking of so much. This is his daughter, one of the Aigazian daughters, Mary, married to a Stephen Mehagian in Phoenix, Arizona. Years later, they said, we want to do something for the next generation. So they put the first funds in the 50s to start a college in the Middle East, in Beirut. They were the first donors. So what name do you want for this college in Beirut? They said, well, he was our mentor, her father, his teacher. And we want to turn the, the memory of genocide and martyrdom into, into something positive for the future generations. So th they gave the name Haigazian to our institution in the 50s. This is the second person who convinced them to do this, another Stephen, Filibosian. They were from Hajan, all of them, and they cooperated to, to found our university. These are some of the handwritings of Armena Haigazian in our library. We have archives, we have many things from him. Now, let me then talk about the lessons. What are the lessons we learn from his story? Well, at least we learn that he put his prestigious education in the service of his people and not for his personal gain. I'm not talking about the value system, an ideal. I'm talking about this man's life. So that's, those are the types of lessons we carry from history. When a story inspires, it inspires, and one does not need to measure inspiration. We do not, cannot measure inspiration. If a story inspires, it inspires. A story has no size. Inspiration has no size. Story has no, not many dimensions. It has an inspiration. Inspiration is life. Inspiration is meaning for existence. In closing, I will move to another family story. On my maternal, paternal grandmother, uh, that is uh, my father's mother's side. She was from the Yeranyan family, from Marash itself. Only two years ago, I had the time to ask questions about this Yeranyan family. I had usually focused on the other side. You know, they're, they're, have been known, so it was easy. But the Yeranian side of the story. So my grandmother, Kester Yeranian, had three brothers. One of them was Avedis. Avedis had a Bible bookshop. He's the one standing outside. This is his shop and whoever is working there. He disappeared in the genocide, and the wife and the child never learned about him. What happened to him? Where did he go? So he's one of those disappeared. A second brother, Vartan, moved to Thessaloniki, where he was pastoring a, a newly started Armenian Protestant church in Thessaloniki for about 10 years, and then he moved to the USA. However, the third one, so my father's maternal uncle. The third one was Hagop. He was a reverend, Hagop Yerania, quite known because I've researched about him. Many American missionaries, educators have written about him, about what he did. And uh, Reverend Hagop Yeranyan was married to a Greek lady, 
Michael Georgiou and his daughters, my father's uncle's daughters were Olympia, Thelma, Rosa, Margaret, Christine, and Hericlia. In 1915, American missionaries in a book, they wrote about him being arrested and sent to exile by himself on the Baghdad railway. And then he escapes and he joins his family again in a town called Afyun Karahisar in Western Turkey. The story I unpacked, this is only two years ago, was that during the Smyrna attack and the burning of Smyrna, and when he, his wife, and possibly two of the daughters were fleeing, like most Greeks and so on, were fleeing to get on the boat, he died. Now, one source says he was killed. Another source says he collapsed and died on the tarmac before getting on the boat. And uh, there was no time for a funeral. So the records say they said a quick prayer and threw his body in the sea. Now, I don't want to romanticize too much. But you know what? If we take stories seriously, the sea starts having another meaning. The sea is the place where you bury people for whom you have no time for a funeral. Not only for my father's uncle, but for so many people in the past years on boats, uh, or uh, boats sinking and, and other types of stories. Now, and yes, this summer in September, the Smyrna story with its centennial is also unpacking in many places like in Greece. And it has its own stories that the world will be inspired by. For some, calling for justice is inspiration. For others, attending an exhibition will inspire. Others, watching a documentary. And we will learn lessons throughout about our life. Topics for further thinking. Maybe for the next conference together, uh, Rector. Memory, unpacked or lost, is a victim of disasters in itself. Memory is a victim in itself. But in times of trial, every detail received and unpacked starts getting greater and deeper significance and we want to cling to every breath of life to be inspired for the future, for a stronger future. Unpacking of memory has its pace, has its risks, has its opportunities, and should be wrapped with ethics, with meaning, with correctness, and with proper education. Otherwise, unpacking of memory becomes a very cheap political tool. Inspiration, dear friends, has no boundaries. Time and space are relative for inspiration. Time and space are relative. Inspiration is the key. Documentation by self and witnesses should be empowering for any time in the future. Even if it is subjective, documentation is important. Inspiration should never stay a slave of memory. Life is to unpack always for the future, but without the past, without memory, there will not be a future and there will be no soul for the body. Unpacking is also the visitation of the truth and the truth sets people free, even if the details seem tragic. Stories that inspire. When we see in stories, when we see dedication, selflessness, sacrificial love, clinging to life, and to hope in the midst of turmoil, or to hope for excellence in the midst of mediocrity, for the spirit, when you look for the spirit in a world of cheaply marketable life, then there is inspiration. If what I presented today is deeply my inspiration, then I'm sure 
you own it too. Efcharisto. Αν αυτέ, κυρίε και κύριοι, δεν είναι ιστορίε που εμπνέουν, ποιε θα μπορούσε να ήταν. Ευχαριστούμε, κύριε Χαϊτοστιάν, για την εξαιρετική σα παρουσίαση. Κυρίε και κύριοι, η γενοκτονία των Αρμενιών αποτελεί μία από τι πλέον μελανέ και σκοτεινέ σελίδε στην παγκόσμια ιστορία. Έχει αφήσει τραυματικό αποτύπωμα στη συλλογική μνήμη του αρμενικού λαού αλλά και όλων των λαών που ιστορικά βρέθηκαν αντιμέτωποι με την αδίστακτη θηριωδία. Ανεξάρτητα, το Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου, αντανακλώντα και την ειλικρινή συμπαράσταση τη ανάλογα βασανισμένη Κύπρου από την τουρκική εισβολή του 1974, συνεχίζει να συμμετέχει σε δράσει μνήμη, τιμώντα έμπραχτα τη γενοκτονία των Αρμενίων. Η εκδήλωση που πραγματοποιείται σήμερα από το Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου επιδεικνύει εξάλλου και τι άριστε σχέσει που διατηρούν σε όλα τα επίπεδα διαχρονικά οι δύο χώρε Κύπρο και Αρμενία, όπω και τη σημαντική διαχρονική στήριξη τη Κύπρου προ τη φίλη χώρα. Είμαι βέβαιη ότι η συνεργασία των δύο χωρών θα συνεχιστεί σε διεθνές επίπεδο, σε διεθνείς οργανισμούς και φόρα, καθώς και μεταξύ των ανώτατων εκπαιδευτικών ιδρυμάτων Κύπρου και Αρμενίας. Κυρίες και κύριοι, σας ευχαριστούμε για την συμμετοχή σας σε αυτή την εκδήλωση μνήμης και σας προσκαλούμε τώρα στη δεξίωση που ακολουθεί. Να είστε καλά. Thank you very much, Mr. Haidostian, once again. And we'll continue with the, now with the δεξίωση. Δεξίωση. Okay. Thank you very much. Πάμε για δεξίωση όλοι τώρα. Να είστε καλά.